Um, before I forget, I can't smell, so I'm not sure, but there's supposed to be food downstairs for us after the Kwanzaanims are making real food. So please join us, stick around. Um, if you're new, please stick around, give us a chance to say hi. If you're not that new, still stick around, get some real food and give us a chance to say hi, and uh, hopefully we'll see you downstairs. But please join us for fellowship downstairs afterwards. Uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are such an amazing God, that you are such a loving and gracious God who cares for us, who loves us, who sent his son to die on the cross for us. Lord, we're nothing, yet you care, yet you are mindful of us. And you prepare the way for us every day. You take care of us. Your hand is on us. Lord, help us to be mindful that you are always there with us. Just as you are here with us now, help us to be mindful that we are always in your presence. Whether it's here at church or outside, we're always in your presence and that you will guide our steps and you will take care. So Lord, as, as we know you are here, we ask that you would speak in this place, that you would speak to us in whatever shape or condition we're in, that you would speak your words of love and grace and mercy to us, and that Lord, you would speak through me, that you would give me the words, that what I speak would not be my words, but would be your words, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. When I was in university, I had a friend. I had a friend, one friend. But uh, you guys have heard a little bit about this friend before. He's the guy with the crazy laugh. But he was a guy that I had met shortly after he had become Christian. So prior to me meeting him, he was kind of the wild child party animal, kind of lived it up. And then when I met him, it had been about a month or so after he had become Christian. So I didn't really know him prior to becoming Christian. But as I got to know him and as I got to know more and more of his friends, something kept happening over and over again. Friends who had known him for years, people who had grown up with him, kept asking, hey, what happened? Something's different. We see you and we notice something different. What's going on? And sometimes they would ask his new Christian friends that he hung out with, sometimes they would ask him. But they kept asking, what, what happened? Something's changed. And for a while, for the longest time, we thought it was kind of weird. Partly because we'd only seen him as a Christian. But we thought it was weird that all these people would be coming up and asking him, what's changed? What's so different about you? But while we thought it was kind of weird, while we thought it was unusual, Peter, Peter tells us this is what happens. This is what happens in the life of Christians. Peter told, told the Christians, set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts. The word for set apart is probably better translated as hallow or honor as holy. In other words, Peter was telling the Christians, give, give God the proper place in your hearts. The proper place and respect in your hearts that God and only God deserves. Don't treat God as an afterthought. Don't treat God with, with your leftovers, but give him the proper reverence and awe that God deserves. Too often, Christians today, we don't give God the respect and the honor that God deserves. We don't give God the reverent awe that God as creator God should get. We call God friend. We call God our homeboy. We call Jesus, hey buddy. And instead of honoring God, we kind of treat him as an equal. Instead of honoring God by showing up early for worship and getting ready, showing up early or, or on time for our weekly appointment with God, we walk in late, unprepared to meet him. We, yet we wait in line for hours for a concert. We wait in line for hours to see the Canucks play. We throw down money like it's nothing to go see our favorite artists or to see our favorite hockey team. Yet we won't give a portion of our money, a portion of what we earn as our offering to God. Because a lot of times we don't give God the proper awe, the reverence that he deserves. Peter tells us to set Christ apart as Lord in our hearts. Yet often we put other things in God's place first. We put all these other things, we fill our heart with 
bunch of other things. And then what we have left, we say, God, this spot's for you. I hope you're happy in this little corner over here. Rather than giving God our best, rather than giving God the awe and reverence he deserves, we give God our leftovers. We give our best to our friends, to our boyfriend or girlfriend. We give our best to work, to school, to people, to things. We don't give our best to God. We give what's left over, and then we wonder why nothing's changed. Peter tells us, honor Christ as Lord in our hearts. That's what we're to do as Christians. And when we do that, when we give God the priority, when we give him the place that he deserves, something happens. Peter tells us we change because we found, because we have a new hope. That hope isn't so much that life is going to be nice and easy, that everything's going to be taken care of and there's going to be no hardships. But that hope is that no matter what happens, no matter what str struggles, trials, no matter what goes on, our lives are in the hands of the only one capable of holding our lives. Our lives are in the best hands. They're in God's hands. Our hope isn't in ourselves. When we, when we put God in the center and when we put God in his place where he belongs, our hope isn't in ourselves. Our hope isn't in other things or in other people. But our hope is in the everlasting God, the one who created the heavens and the earth. Simply by speaking, he created. The one who sent his son to die for us. When we put God at the center of our lives, our hope is in an unbreakable, unshakable, unfailing God. But when we put other things in the center of our lives, friends, money, careers, ourselves, when we put other things in the center of our lives, those things all fail. They're all things that break, die, fall apart, can't survive. But when our hope is in a living, breathing, loving God, our lives are in the best hands possible. And when we have that hope, that hope changes the way, our, the way we live. And that hope, that hope was what changed my friend. He went from being a womanizer, a guy who went clubbing and got drunk every weekend, to a guy who hung out with Christians, who started going to church who couldn't get enough of reading his Bible and singing praises to God. This guy had a collection that was like half, half a bookcase of gangster rap and stuff like that. And he got rid of that because he had a new hope. His vocabulary changed. The words he used, he would go around saying, effing this, effing that. And his vocabulary started changing. The way he, started, the way he treated people started changing. He went from living for, a mo for the moment to living for eternity. His life changed because he had a new hope in Christ. And it was that. That was what people noticed. That was what they noticed, and that was what they kept asking him about. I met him after he had become Christian, so I didn't see the difference. I only saw him after. But the friends who knew him before were amazed. They were like, guy. And they, these were actually friends who would use the word guy. They were like, guy, what's changed? You weren't like this before. And that opened the door. By them asking, it opened the door for him to share. And at first, he didn't know how to share. At first, he didn't know what to share with them. He'd just tell them that he met Jesus, and he didn't know how else to go on. But it opened the door for them. They would open the door by asking, and it gave them a chance to speak into their lives. I wish he had taken Peter's advice a little bit more seriously back then, but Peter goes on to say, be ready to explain the hope. Peter says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, for, to, who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. My friend, had he taken Peter's words more seriously, would have been prepared to answer his friends when they asked him. Peter knew that as Christ enters our lives, our lives change. And as our lives change, people notice, and people become curious. And as people become curious, they want to know what's going on. And so Peter says, be ready. Be ready to explain the reason for your hope. Peter knew that a changed life would draw questions, would draw people in. 
And he says, be ready. When those people come and ask you questions, when those people come and ask what's going on, be ready to answer them. Be ready to tell them. Too often as Christians, we don't know enough about our faith. We don't know enough about our Bible. We don't know enough about what we believe, let alone how to share that with someone who wants to know. As Christians, Peter tells us, it's not good enough to just know what we believe. We need to be able to share what we believe with others. We need to be able to tell them. Some of you guys, some of you guys have heard this from me before, but my, in my, when I was in seminary, my professor made us write our conversion story, and he gave us 25 pages. He said 25 page maximum, and I was thinking, dude, I got it in two pages. What do I need the other 23 for? But as I started writing, and he told us to think back and stuff, as I started writing, I ended up with 23 pages. 23 pages of my conversion story. 23 pages, which equivalent was equated to about 23 years of my life, of God working in my life to bring me to him. I want to encourage you guys, stop, think. Even if you don't write out your, your conversion story in, in an essay, take time to think through your conversion story. Take time to look back at all the points in your life where God has been, all the points where God has been doing stuff, all the people that God has brought into your life to bring you to where you are. And if you feel like it, write it out. For 20 pages or whatever, write it out. But then after you write it out, cut it down. Cut it down to two minutes. Cut it down to two minutes. The Christian author says that average elevator ride is two minutes. And so he cut down his testimony into two minutes so that he could share his testimony with anybody he meets in an elevator. Write out your full conversion story, and you'll see, you'll get a glimpse of how amazing God is, how God has worked in your life, and you didn't even realize it. But then after you've written out the full story, cut it down to two minutes, and know it, memorize it, so that you can share it with anybody, someone on the street, a friend who asks you, someone you're stuck in an elevator with for two minutes. If you know your story, if you know what you believe, and you can summarize it succinctly in two minutes, you can share it with anybody, anywhere. But then Peter goes on. As you prepare, as you prepare to share the reason of, for your hope, Peter says to do it with gentleness and respect. Sadly, those two words are words that I that are seldom used by non-Christians to describe Christians. Gentle and respectful. Some of you guys have heard this story from me before. Some of you may have heard it elsewhere. But Eugene Peterson tells the story about the first person he converted. School childhood bully used to pick on him every day. And one day he looked at the guy and figured, I can take him. Or at least I can get a few shots in. And so one day he rushed him and took him down. And before he knew it, he had this bully pinned. He, the, he had his knees on the bully's arms, and the guy couldn't do anything. And Eugene Peterson it was pounding away on the guy's face. But as he was pounding away on the guy's face, he's sitting there going, Do you believe in Jesus? And the bully's like, No. Do you believe in Jesus? No. Do you believe in Jesus? And the, finally, the bully's like, Yes. And so Eugene Peterson got off him and let him go. If you ever see Eugene Peterson, he's like this really frail-looking old guy. So to try to picture him like doing that to some bully, it was hard to imagine. We may not physically beat people and get them to say they believe in Jesus, but a lot of times, I think we emo emotionally, spiritually beat people to try to get them to say they believe in Jesus. Rather than showing them love and grace like Christ showed us, we make them feel guilty. We point our fingers at them. We say they're going to burn in hell unless they believe in Jesus. We beat them over the heads, over their head, 